Hi, this is Leila Kincaid, and I want to talk to you about the stories of the cosmoses. What elephants and turtles can teach us about quantum cosmology and cosmogayan consciousness. Understanding quantum entanglement and epistemological pluralism. Quantum cosmology can help us answer questions like, what is the universe? What is being, existence, reality? Can we know the truth about reality? Can we ascertain what the cosmos is and when it started and why these questions matter? Cosmology is the science of the origin and development of the universe. When I think about what it is to be in the cosmos, we stare at the sky in wonder and awe, and we're told we're here in this tiny little spot in this vast universe of billions and billions of stars. As Carl Sagan taught us in Cosmos, this great documentary series, I think of us as cosmogians here on Earth, staring up at the stars and wondering who we are and where we came from with the very specific consciousness that we are on Earth. So this is the way we have these Earth and Sky cosmogenies with the Sky Father, Earth Mother. And here in Monty Python's great funny film, The Meaning of Life, there's the famous galaxy song and I want to share a part of it with you as I explore cosmogayanism and quantum cosmology. 30,000 light years from galactic central point. We go round every 200 million years. And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in this amazing and expanding universe. Scientific Omniscience and the Implicate Order. David Bohm wrote about this idea that we can know the universe and that there is an order to it, just like that beautiful image of the um, field of being, um, that green space-time continuum creating the goddess who was impregnated by a star and gave birth to what? I don't know, an implicate order. Bohm says, in some sense, man is a microcosm of the universe, and therefore what man is, is a clue to the universe. We are enfolded in the universe. Because we arise out of and dwell in this ocean of being, we have within us the capacity to know reality. That's the scientific omniscience. And Carl Jung wrote about this too in his writings on synchronicity. He says our psyches are structured by the cosmos and therefore we have the capacity to know the truth about reality. This leads to my ideas about epistemological pluralism and the idea that there are lots of possible answers to know, the, to know what we can know and how we can know what we know and they can all be correct. Pluralism is this idea that there's no single consistent method of attaining knowledge, but a plurality that when meshed together may help paint a bigger picture. And I like to apply this in my studies with cosmological um, inquiry and quantum cosmology to sort of go, ah, what are all these theories of the universe? And sort of take them all together to paint a bigger picture of the whole, like the Buddhist parable of the six blind men and the elephant where each one of them holds a different part of the elephant and insists it's something else, but they're all describing reality the way they see it, just like us, and together they assemble a larger understanding of the truth. Epistemological pluralism can inform our cosmological speculations, and Timothy Ferris says on the origin of the cosmos, even cosmogonic speculations tell us more about ourselves than the universe. They claim to describe all to some extent that psycholo their psychological projections cast outward from the mind unto the sky. I like this as we are we will go into looking at Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle and that these, these cosmogonic speculations tell us about ourselves. And this is a crux for me. Um, the doctrine of causation 
Ferris says, banished the issue of first cause to exile in realms beyond science. Can you go the other way back outside of the Big Bang, outside the barrier, and finally answer the question of why there is something rather than nothing? He was citing Leibniz. No, Ferris says, you cannot within science, but it still remains an incredible mystery. Why is there something instead of nothing? And this ad infinitum, ad absurdum question of cause looms in our inquiry. But it does lead us to Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. And when he talks about quantum observership and quantum measurement as central to our understanding of quantum physics, and he says the universe is fundamentally a quantum system. And to help me understand what he meant by that, I watched the new movie Oppenheimer. And when in the movie Oppenheimer met met Heisenberg and listened to his lecture and afterwards he said in quantum mechanics is light made up of particles or waves it's both it's paradoxical and yet it works and this kind of grasps for me how we can look at reality and try to understand what the cosmos is it's this quantum cosmology understanding that it's this and that it's a particle and a wave Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle lets us see a particle or its trajectory, but not both at the same time. And every act of, of observation is disruptive. So there's so, very, something about the universe that we're observing that's completely affected by the goggles we're wearing, the way we're looking at it. An example of quantum entanglement that I love is these stars that were photographed recently by the James Webb Space Telescope, and they appear to display hexagonal six-pointed light because the instrument looking at them is six-sided. It is these mirrors, um, these hexagonal mirrors on the James Webb Space Telescope show the stars appearing to have six points, but they don't. It's the nature of the observer, the tool that's making them appear to be six six pointed. This to me demonstrates Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle or principle of uncertainty because light travels as a wave and when it comes up against a boundary it is redirected and sent off in a different direction and it diffracts. So the hexagonal shape of the primary mirror segments were always going to mean that all the stars that the JWST observed would have six diffraction spikes. It really captures this quantum observership effect on our understanding of the nature of reality. Carrie Welch talks about uh, something else with quantum observership and the ontological function of time. She says, as we be understand position, right? Positionality as relative, here we go with the word relative, and I'm thinking of Einstein's theory of relativity, to the position of the observer. It makes sense that we might experience time in contrast between our internal and external frequencies. I can't wait to see what else she writes about this. This concept moves us away from a notion of absolute time, which I think of as a fixed model, toward a mathematical model of subjective and relative time. And this makes me think about how time is linked to being in Heidegger's theories and Tibetan cosmology. It's depicted in images like the Kalachakra mandala, whose function is to help us experience a sense of oneness with the cosmos. This also leads me to talking about Stephen Hawking. I love this quote where he says, I want to make a proposal for the quantum state of the universe. The proposal incorporates this idea that the universe is completely self-contained and there is nothing outside the universe. The Hartle Hawking model suggests that there is no moment of creation. And I think this is so important in our quantological queries quantum cosmological queries. There's, there's nothing outside of or before the universe unless there are multiverses. Hawking suggests there's no boundary to space-time, so there's no need to specify a behavior at the boundary there. There would be no singularities at which the laws of science broke down and no edges of space-time at which one would have to appeal to God or some new law to set the boundary conditions for space-time. One could say that the boundary condition of the universe is that it has no boundary. 
the universe would be completely self-contained and not affected by anything outside of us itself that would be neither created nor destroyed. See, it's getting back to the Newtonian second law of thermodynamics. It's there, there is no new energy in the universe. Nothing's created or destroyed. It just is, which is why Sartre's great question, and I didn't include this here, was, you know, what, not question, he's saying kind of in an answer to Leibniz, it makes no sense to say, um, why is there being instead of nothing? Because there's just existence. Let's talk about existence. There's no essence that precedes existence. Existence is what is. That is the essence of the situation. I love Sartre's play with words. And if you ever give yourself time to cast aside any preconceptions or prejudices about existentialism, nihilism, atheism, or Sartre, and read his gorgeous, beautiful opus that's so important for this discussion about quantum cosmology and consciousness, and, and read Being and Nothingness. It's a very hopeful, beautiful, and spiritual answer to the question of why is there being instead of nothing. So uh, continuing along the lines of quantum cosmology, I, I did bring up the Newton's second law of thermodynamics, which I've been obsessed with forever because it helps me make sense in the context of um, making sense of death, um, considering theories of reincarnation, looking at the Tibetan Book of the Dead and methods for staying conscious when you die and choosing what your next life is going to be. You can see this in movies like what dreams may come with Robin Williams. And I, I think it's, it's valuable to continue with this epistemological pluralistic line of inquiry and method and framework for understanding the nature of the cosmos by taking all of these different theories, like the six blind men to create our elephant that represents reality. And if there are, if there's no new energy in the universe, then it, where does it go? It just changes. This is exciting to me. And I link this to Stephen Hawking's story in A Brief History of Time, where he talks about this well-known scientist, maybe it was Bertrand Russell, who gave a lecture on astronomy, and he described how the Earth orbits around the sun and the sun around the center of the galaxy. And at the end of the lecture, an old lady at the back is laughing at him and says, what you told us is rubbish. The world is a flat plate supported on the back of a tur tortoise. And the scientist gave a superior smile before smile, saying, well, what is the tortoise standing on? And she says, you're very clever, young man, very clever. But it's turtles all the way down. I mean, this is great. She's capturing this Newtonian idea of the second law of thermodynamics. She's capturing this uncertainty about how we observe and describe reality. She's talking about this quantum system that is closed and doesn't have a beginning or an ending that Hawking talks about. And Terry Pratchett, the famous novelist who wrote the Discworld series, has created this cosmology in which the Earth, Earth, uh, lives on the back of a turtle and that turtle lives on the back of a turtle and the whole cosmos is turtles all the way down. This is really great. And he used, was giving an homage to Galileo who said, and yet it moves, representing his advocacy for the heliocentric solar system model that he was forced to recant. But it is a, a great nod to astronomy and cosmology that somehow turtles right now are a very beautiful metaphor for our understanding. I'd like to lead this into the new discovery of gravitational waves background and Einstein's theory of relativity. These waves hold everything together. These new, all these scientists from various scientific organizations all over the world came together and compiled data over the past decade of using telescopes and, and, and looking at theories of, of these gravitational waves. And they have, they found proof that yes, indeed, gravitational waves permeate the entire universe. They create everything. They are out of which everything emerges and they permeate the entire, permeate the entire cosmos. Quantum cosmology can be described, says Ferris, as an attempt to find the wave function of the universe. And a wave function is a mathematical description of this quantum system, this 
abstract plenum that contains all possible three-dimensional geometries. And what a beautiful unified field theory this is. There's Einstein scribbling away saying it's all connected, it's all connected. And his theory of relativity was trying to understand how gravity affects the fabric of space-time. He developed his theory of general relativity to predict accelerating massive bodies that will produce gravitational waves that will go throughout all of space-time. And surely, as Fritjof Capra talks about, these waves have a, 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 um, a harmonic resonance. And Rupert Sheldrake also talks about this morphic resonant resonance, these fields that link everything together, these patterns are rippling throughout space and time, creating reality as we know it. This is extremely exciting. And I like, I want to learn more about the gravitational waves background. And I, I do see Bohm, Ferris talks about how Bohm was developing a relativist quantum field theory that could explain the waves background and prove Einstein right. And I think that's what these scientists today did. Hawking also said that he had been able through mathematics um, to derive the quantum wave function of the universe. So I feel like all of these different people that are pointing to this wave function are onto something, don't you? I love these pictures. Here's uh, quantum cosmology and gravitational waves background. You have Einstein on the left with his unified field theory. And then you have Heidegger, who was talking about the ontological function of time. This kind of reminds me of what Carrie Welch is talking about. He says that time emits being. This is in Being and Time um, 2648. Um, that's his original manuscript, page number 26, and then 48 in the book I'm reading. And I have references at the end of this presentation. I'll also provide it as a paper. Time emits being. Being cannot exist outside of time. Being is a wave function. Now, I added that in. Time controls wave functions. Heidegger was a series of footnotes on Aristotle because Aristotle talked about being and time linked together. And he writes a lot about this in metaphysics when he talks about his efficient cause. And this also reminds me of um, Gebser's ever-present origin. And I would like to really develop a paper about this particular slide. And I think include Carrie Welch's research. So here's this sort of referring back to that field that that goddess emerged out of in the Monty Python uh, film and Fritjof Capra's idea of emerging structures of being. I love this theory of the tubular torus nature of reality constantly unfolding everywhere, this omnipresent ever emerging being that's happening. And we're part of it. Here we are emerging, you know, as our own fields of tubular, tubular tori on earth in the cosmos, ever emerging realities, ever, ever emerging being. We're focal points of awareness of the universe evolving and becoming aware of itself. Um, and that's how I think of us as cosmogians. We're on earth and in the cosmos and that awareness gives us cosmogian consciousness. You know, we know when we study cosmology that we come from stardust or stars. We are stardust and we evolved on Earth. You know, we're these little infinitesimal pieces of dust, so vulnerable and fragile and fleeting and yet somehow eternal and interconnected. It's very exciting. And this leads me to my idea at everyone, there's lots of people who have the idea. I'm not going to say it's my idea. I believe that we do live in a multiverse. The origin of the universe, says Timothy Ferris in Coming of, the, Coming of Age in the Milky Way Galaxy, the origin of the universe remains a great mystery and perhaps always will. But the vacuum genesis ideas have continued to bear fruit. Several leading cosmologists like Andre Lind have constructed consistent and physically reasonable models in which our universe is one among many, perhaps an infinite number of universes, and these new universes bubble up out of the vacuum of pre-existing ones. The question of whether it had an origin cannot be answered. And if it's turtles all the way down, then the multiverse exists and there is no one universe story. The story of the cosmos is that there are an infinite number of cosmoses or cosmi, and there are an infinite number of stories that try to describe them. 
And if there is a God, it is a star breathing one. Brian Swim and Thomas Berry say in the universe story that we should think of the human story as part of the earth and cosmos stories. They seek to awaken modern human consciousness to our ultimate interconnectedness as what I call cosmogians. I wonder if framing the entire universe story anthropocentrically around the idea that the apotheosis of the processes since the great flaring forth is the human being on earth realizing its interconnectedness is valuable to our endeavor to understand what it is to be human in the cosmos. Whatever story we may tell, surely there is value in opening our minds to our ultimate cosmogenesis and entanglement with all being that includes an understanding that other modes of being and manifestations of consciousness might not look anything like human beings on earth at all. There may be cosmo beings elsewhere who are not Gaian, and I invite you to consider our positionality as cosmo Gaians as we inquire into the nature of the cosmos.